This program was produced by Accuracy in Media, a media watchdog organization in Washington, D.C., representing the consumers of news. As the 10th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War approached, we began to see a new attitude towards the war and America's role in it. This new mood was symbolized by the completion of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., with the unveiling of this statue, portraying the men who fought and died in that far-off land as heroes. At the same time, this country experienced a new wave of patriotic sentiment. With it came a rejection of the notion that Vietnam was an ignoble war. And we accomplished all of our missions, sir. We failed this country not one step. We never dropped a flag, nor did we ever turn our backs. The soldiers of the Vietnam War met our nation's highest standards of service. The house-to-house -house battles for Way, the murderous shellings absorbed at Khe San, tested the courage of our soldiers no less than the battles of World War II in Korea. After seeing the horrible consequences of communist rule in Indochina, the Holocaust in Cambodia, and the flight of the boat people from Vietnam, Americans came to recognize that this was a war we should have fought to win. Why didn't we? There's no single answer to that question, but many believe that our will to win was eroded by the way our media, especially television, reported the war. Hello, I'm Charlton Heston. Vietnam has been called the first television war because in the 1960s, television became our electronic window on the world, shaping perceptions of ordinary citizens and even affecting high-level foreign policy decisions. The war was never far away. It was right there in our living rooms, every night. In 1983, PBS, the public broadcasting service, came forward with a 13-part television series on Vietnam. Neither the series nor the companion book by Stanley Carno fully explored the issue of media's involvement in the domestic turmoil that was Vietnam. When the PBS series about Vietnam was broadcast during the fall of 1983, those citizens concerned about the impact of media on American politics were gravely disappointed. Rather than coming forward with new insights, the series reiterated many of the same journalistic errors of the 1960s. Those who believed that the past must be recorded accurately so we can plan for the future dare not leave such a distorted report unchallenged. The focus of our program will be on the Tet Offensive of 1968, an event which marked a turning point in the Vietnam War. During the last days of January 1968, the Viet Cong launched a series of assaults on the major cities of Vietnam, including the national capital, Saigon. Communist planners assumed that local populations would rally to the Viet Cong and that the army of South Vietnam would collapse. As the initial advantage of surprise waned, it became increasingly clear that neither assumption was justified. Civilians in the South did not rally to the communist banner. The army of South Vietnam showed itself to be capable of sustained engagement with the enemy. Tet's two protracted battles at the Khe San outpost and the city of Hue ended with huge communist losses. By early spring of 1968, the nationwide offensive was acknowledged to be a complete and utter disaster. In fact, Viet Cong units were so crushed that the remainder of the war was fought chiefly by regular forces from the north. But the real story of Tet never got to American audiences. Instead, by focusing exclusively on Tet's pyrotechnics, the American media, especially television, created a very negative impression. One of the most devastating media dramas during the Tet Offensive took place at the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Sometime around 3 a.m. on January 31st, 1968, a squad of 19 Viet Cong infiltrators drove to the U.S. Embassy. They planted explosive charges against the wall surrounding the embassy grounds and blew a hole large enough to get through. 
During the opening moments of the assault, the Viet Cong commander was killed. From then until mid-morning, the fight for the embassy grounds was a losing situation for the attackers. Although major media reported otherwise, at no time did the Viet Cong get into the embassy building. It was all over by 11 a.m. Ambassador Bunker was at his desk by noon. Keeping these vital facts in mind, let's see some representative media reports from the embassy. Snipers are in the building and on rooftops near the embassy and are firing on American personnel inside the compound. Twenty suicide commandos are reported to be holding the first floor of the embassy and some were still there toward daybreak. Twenty-six men break a hole in the wall of the American embassy compound and they don't get past three marines on the door. There were only three marines guarding the American embassy at the outset. They didn't get past those three marines. But it was reported by networks that they had broken into the embassy, they were on the third floor, they were on the eighth floor, and it was never retractions. Communist commandos penetrated the supposedly attack-proof building in the climax of a combined artillery and guerrilla assault that brought limited warfare to Saigon itself. Associated Press photographer Dan Van Falk, who got inside the building, reported bodies were strewn around the rooms. He said the Viet Cong wore gray uniforms with cartridge belts and that some had red armbands. They got into the yard, but they didn't get any further. They did not get into the embassy building, but this was reported on American television, despite the fact that when I arrived on the scene, um, as the last... Viet Cong was uh, in the process of uh, being uh, disposed of. I went in the building, I went to the top and walked through every floor. I came down and in the, on the embassy grounds I held a press conference and said I had just been through the building, I had just talked to Washington, given them a report, and that they, there was no enemy in the building and none had entered the embassy building. George MacArthur was a correspondent in Vietnam during Tet. It had become a symbol of the American presence in Saigon. In conjunction with the adversarial relationship that had been created by the press, uh, and the fact that a goodly number of the newspaper men there literally detested uh, the American authority figure, if you will, and it was symbolized in that building. They were conditioned by their adversarial relationship with the military to believe the worst. And when the worst happened to that which was the symbol, uh, then the temptation, as we say in the newspaper business, to take it and run was too great for uh, many to resist. And within that next four or five hours, our, our defeat uh, was recorded for the whole world to see and rejoice in. Uh, it was untrue, but it, the damage had been done, and you can't catch things like that. Well, at the time of the Tet Offensive, I was the director of information at the Embassy of Vietnam here in Washington. And... Uh, because of that the function of mine, I had a very good vantage point. After 48 hours, the whole thing becomes very clear. That is, uh, the, the communists have been thrown out of the, the major point of attacks. And there's only a couple of uh, cities uh, where there was still fighting going on. In his monumental study of Tet reporting, Peter Braestrup reminds us, Hanoi didn't claim a victory, psychological, symbolic, or otherwise, at the embassy but American newsmen were quick to award Hanoi a major psychological triumph there. Robert Elegant is an award-winning journalist who covered the war for the Los Angeles Times. He's written with insight about Vietnam and media. 1981, I published an article entitled How to Lose a War in a rather obscure British intellectual magazine called Encounter. I wrote about Vietnam and I said that for the first time in history, a, the outcome of a major conflict was determined not on the battlefield nor in the negotiating chambers, but on the printed page and the television screen. Trung Nu Tang was once the Viet Cong Minister of Justice. Now he lives in exile from communist tyranny. We lost a lot of fighters. Nous avons cinq divisions. We had five divisions, the first, the third, the fifth, seventh, and ninth. But after the Tet Offensive, all these divisions ended up with not even half of their forces. Je crois que les Américains n'ont pas soupi 
the, f the fourth best human. From the military point of view, I believe that the Americans at Tet did not sustain great losses of human lives. But from the political point of view, it was a very heavy blow for President Johnson's government. Cela a permis au mouvement anti-guerre américain de The loss made the American anti-war movement exert pressure on the American government. Donc, nous gagnons ce que nous, ce que nous perdons sur le plan militaire.